In the autumn of 1862, the governments of France and Great Britain proposed to Russia the joint recognition by European powers of the independence of the Confederate States of America. My immediate answer was, I will not cooperate in such action and I will not acquiesce. On the contrary, I shall accept the recognition of the independence of the Confederate States by France and Great Britain as a casus belli for Russia. And in order that the governments of France and Great Britain may understand that this is no idle threat, I will send the Pacific Fleet to San Francisco and an Atlantic Fleet to New York. Sealed orders to both admirals were given. My fleets arrived at the American ports. There was no recognition of the Confederate States but Great Britain and France. The American rebellion was put down and the great American Republic continues. Alexander, Tsar of all the Russians. On the morning of September 24th, 1863, the citizens of the city of New York woke up to see something in the city's harbor that had never been seen there before. Anchored in the great harbor was a fleet of imperial Russian warships. America was at war, not with Russia, but with itself. It was a dark period for the young nation. The Union of the North had just suffered a devastating and demoralizing defeat at Chickamauga. The battle was the worst Union defeat in the entire war and ranked second highest in number of casualties after the Battle of Gettysburg. The increasing prospect of an ultimate Confederate victory in the war and the real possibility of an imminent attack from Britain and France in support of the Southern Rebellion left America vulnerable and without allies. President Lincoln and his young nation were alone and surrounded by enemies. During uh, the 19th century, uh, Russia was really the greatest friend of the United States. And in fact, uh, Russia helped to save the United States by coming to the aid of America during the Civil War in diplomatic and military terms. Uh, and if it wasn't for the Russian help, it could be that there would be no United States today. Uh, so to get into a little understanding of this, in uh, 1861, uh, we had uh, the beginning of the Civil War. And the Civil War tore the country apart uh, between North and South. Uh, and England and France were very, very sympathetic to the Confederacy for a number of reasons. England and France felt uh, that uh, the U.S. was a danger to them, actually. They were afraid of the growing power of America. Also, uh, England uh, wanted to benefit from uh, slave labor, providing cheap cotton from the southern states. And the French were looking to uh, create a new French empire in Mexico and they, have, they felt, the French felt that the Confederates would allow them to do that and the United States Washington government would not. So they were actually preparing to help the Confederate States to achieve independence. This was a period when England and France uh, were trying to expand their empires tremendously England was actually, many people in England were actually looking to try to recover their, their American empire that became the United States, or a large part of it. And therefore, uh, if the South had won, it is very possible uh, that uh, the remaining part of the country would have been overcome by other 
uh, European nations, including England and France. England had a huge base in Canada, naval base in Halifax, Canada. We had many thousands of troops in Canada. And the English were actually seriously considering in invading the United States. And they were helping the southern states in many ways, including building ships, or, you know, military and naval ships, providing arms, money, and so on. And there's even, actually, there's some uh, tangential indication, evidence, that uh, the British Secret Service were involved in the assassination of President Lincoln as well. Uh, 1862, uh, French, uh, the French Emperor, uh, Napoleon III, uh, wanted to organize intervention in the Civil War uh, with England and with Russia intervening to uh, passed by the situation, but in what that was their, the way they phrased it. Russia uh, was long afraid, uh, essentially, of England and France uh, and their intentions toward Russia. England and France had actually intervened in Russia during the Crimean War and had helped the Turks, the Islamic Turks, to win a victory in the Crimean War. And the Russians were afraid that there might be, uh, England and France were planning to do it again. And it, there was a rebellion growing in Poland in the late uh, 1850s, early 1860s. And the United States was also afraid of uh, the intentions of England and France during the Civil, civil War, and which started in 1861, went on to 1865 in the United States, uh, because the British and the French were in a period of growing their empire as fast as they could. They were increasing their empire all over the world. And there were people in England and France that had designs on the Western Hemisphere. Napoleon III had invaded Mexico and set up a puppet emperor Maximilian in Mexico. And the British were looking to help the southern states because of several reasons, including the fact that the southern states were providing them with cheap cotton, and also to weaken Washington, because the British were also afraid of the growth of the United States. So there was a suspicious feeling, so suspicious enemies on both sides, both the Russians and Americans were deeply suspicious of the British and the French, and that kind of drew them together, and they became the best of allies in uh, the 19th century. Much of the 19th century, uh, in fact, they were the only allies that they had. Each one had the other as the only ally. America was actually the only country that supported Russia during the Crimean War, that officially diplomatically said that Russia was on the right side in the Crimean War. When the American Civil War broke out, uh, Napoleon III, uh, try to get England and Russia to join uh, in, in an intervention, which would essentially have meant intervention to help the southern states succeed and to expand the empire of England and France uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Russian Tsar Alexander II was uh, sympathetic to the North and Abraham Lincoln uh, for a number of reasons. One, he was a very uh, idealistic person who was uh, governed by ideas of orthodoxy as, as he perceived them and wanted to liberate the world as much as possible. He actually liberated the serfs of Russia, freed them from bondage in Russia. And he had sympathy towards Lincoln's uh, the abolitionist views and views that uh, slaves should be free. Uh, also, he was against breaking up uh, the American Union because he felt that this would be something that would benefit the English and French who were looking to break up uh, the Russian Empire as well. So he was strongly in support of Washington at a time when nobody else was internationally. The only country that had any, any kind of a support for Washington was the Russian government under Emperor Tsar Alexander II. 
So uh, the first two years of the Civil War, uh, the French tried to get intervention and try to help with the English, help the southern states, and the Russians kept saying no. In fact, they, they actually said diplomatically to the British and the French, they told them to stay out of the Civil War, do not militarily intervene, or that they will face Russia joining with the United States in fighting them to defend uh, America. Alexander II specifically threatened to intervene militarily on the side of the Union if the British and the French uh, went in against the Union. Uh, and he therefore uh, wanted to do what he could ha to help the Union in more than diplomatic terms. During the first two years of the Civil War, uh, the United States uh, military had many setbacks. And uh, Alexander decided to do what he could to help them. So in 1863, he actually sent almost the entire Russian Navy to America to help protect the United States. Now he sent in September of 1863, he sent uh, about, he sent the Baltic fleet to New York and the Baltic fleet patrolled not only New York, but also went to Washington. The ships actually went uh, uh, along the east coast of the United States from all the way from Boston to Washington, D.C. and landed and based themselves in New York City to be a shield for the United States. And this is the Baltic Fleet. The Pacific Fleet went to San Francisco and patrolled there for uh, quite a while, about six months, patrolled that area uh, in case of an attack on the western part of the United States. And we had, uh, in both fleets, we, we had uh, one of the biggest uh, ships in the whole world, which the Russians had uh, created in those days, plus many thousands of troops and Russian Marines that were there. And we know that the uh, Tsar had actually ordered the admirals in charge of the fleet, so Admiral Popov uh, in, on the West Coast and the other admirals, in case of an attack on the United States by England or France, they were to defend the United States and in fact uh, the admiral in charge of uh, the Baltic fleet, which was based in New York, said that it was told, he was told uh, by secret orders of the Tsar, Tsar Alexander, that if there was an attack to the United States by England and France, he was to proceed to Washington and place himself under the orders of Abraham Lincoln to defend America. Turlow Weed has spoken, has written in his uh, memoirs uh, uh, that uh, uh, there was a specific order given by Alexander II to protect uh, the United States in case of attack by Britain or France, and that the, his uh, admirals in charge would report to Abraham Lincoln for orders if a, any British or French force attacks the United States, they would report to Lincoln and ask for orders what Lincoln wanted them to do to defend America. They would place themselves under the command of the United States, which is something which is amazing. Uh, I, even today, it would be totally amazing to have something like that happen. But it happened then. Uh, when the ships, ships came in New York September of uh, 1863, and they were welcomed uh, as saviors by much of America. There was a huge parties were set up with them parade on Fifth Avenue, and they were uh, regaled and uh, uh, made like the heroes of the day because they felt, many Americans felt that this was what was saving them in the Civil War in, against the South and against England and France. Shadowed so long by the storm cloud of danger, thou whom the prayers of an empire defend, welcome, thrice welcome, but not as a stranger. Come to the nation that calls thee its friend. Bleak are our shores with the blasts of December. Fettered and chill is the rivulet's flow. 
throbbing and warm are the hearts that remember. Who was our friend when the world was our foe? Look on the lips that are smiling to greet thee. See the fresh flowers that a people has strewn. Count them thy sisters and brothers that meet thee. Guest of the nation, her heart is thine own. Fires of the north in eternal communion. Blend your broad flashes with the evening's bright star. God bless the empire that loves the great union. Strength to her people, long life to the Tsar. Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the same thing happened uh, in the West Coast when they came to San Francisco. It was a huge, huge uh, celebration. And in fact, the Russians actually in San Francisco set about patrols to protect San Francisco. There was a report that a Confederate raider called the Shenandoah was coming near San Francisco. And this was a, a basically a British built a military raider commanded by Confederates, which was very powerful. And the admiral in charge, Admiral Popov in charge, ordered his ships to patrol the area and defend uh, the West Coast against the Confederate raiders. On October 23rd, 1863, there was a huge fire in San Francisco, which the people of San Francisco, which was a very, uh, you know, undeveloped, relatively small place in those days, were unable to handle and extinguish. So what happened was the Russian Admiral, Admiral Popov, sent hundreds of Russian sailors, soldiers, and officers to be firemen and protect San Francisco in the fire. And they were the ones who actually put out the fire. And the people of San Francisco were so happy about it that eventually they uh, gave the Russians special gold medals in gratitude for the protection of San Francisco. Six uh, Russian uh, naval personnel were killed fighting the fire. And uh, the Orthodox Church in California celebrates the anniversary of the San Francisco fire every year and uh, the good deeds of the Russians who saved uh, San Francisco from being destroyed by the fire. One of the Russian officers there, by the way, uh, in San Francisco was Rimsky-Korsakov. Some people, some people believe that Rimsky-Korsakov actually composed uh, the flight to the bumblebee based on San Francisco. This news of the Russians was a huge encouragement to the United, St uh, United States uh, and to Abraham Lincoln in many, many ways. Uh, because 1863, even though the U.S. had some victories, the Russians came there right after the Battle of Chickamauga, which was a huge defeat for the Union. And there was actual fear that Lee was going to attack Washington, D.C. Uh, and he was planning, he was actually planning on sending a huge force to try to take Washington. And there are uh, scholars who believe that seeing the Russian intervention uh, dissuaded Lee from actually going and attacking Washington as well. Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, who was one of the greatest writers at the time, uh, uh, was very congratulatory to the Russians, and in fact, he said, uh, thank God for the Russians. Uh, Gideon uh, Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, also publicly said, thank God for the Russians. And many of the leaders of America recognized for many years that the Russians were instrumental even in saving the United States. The ships were there until 1864, when the U.S. was uh, winning the war more, uh, and uh, then they left to go back to Russia. So for many years, the story was celebrated, for at least 50 years. But then in the 20th century, uh, we started having a different point of view. And we should mention this number of scholars, because partly, uh, I would say, due to the growth of communism, and the Cold War, a number of scholars have uh, s tried to get evidence and argued that the Russians really were inconsequential in what they did. And well, anyway, what they did was for their own benefit because they wanted to get their ships out of harbors 
you know, the Baltic, uh, Baltic seaport and the Pacific harbors. So the British and the French, if they wanted to, couldn't attack them, bottle them up in the harbors. But if you really look into this, first of all, the Tsar has clearly indicated, and, it, and his foreign minister indicated, that uh, this was a supporting move for the United States. Second, if the Russian government uh, just wanted to remove uh, the naval ships from uh, Russian ports where they could be bottled up by the British and the French, why would they move them to New York and the East Coast when the British had huge naval bases in Halifax and also in the West Indies, the West Indian Command, where they could easily come to the West Coast either from Canada or, or from the West Indies. Also, the British were in Canada on the other side. They're not that far from San Francisco. They could have really uh, attacked San Francisco easily if it wasn't for the Russian ships. It, it would have made more sense if they wanted to uh, save the ships, and that was the only reason it would have made more sense to send them much further away, like in South America, uh, like Argentina or something like that, which is what the Germans, by the way, did in World War I and World War II. They sent many of the naval ships uh, for protection to South American harbors, way, way off from the United States. And this made the Russian ships much more vulnerable than they would have been anywhere else uh, in the Western Hemisphere. So we know from uh, the writings of the Russian diplomats, from the recognition of uh, the actions by American leaders and by the actual actions of the Russians who went on patrol, aggressive patrol, in, San in the San Francisco area against the attack on the West Coast, that uh, the real reason for sending them was to protect the United States. And even that was, of course, partly uh, something which the Russians felt was in their interest, but it was also because the Tsar, Tsar Alexander II, was a very uh, religious humanitarian person who was identifying with Lincoln, and he had a long correspondence, substantial correspondence with Lincoln, in which they, uh, they became quite friendly in many ways. And when Lincoln died, uh, Tsar Alexander sent condolences uh, to his family, and he said that he was the greatest Christian of us all. Uh, by the way, I should also mention when the, part, when the, uh, the Russians were greeted at a big party, huge party in New York, that uh, the wife of Abraham Lincoln was the hostess of the party, and she came here from Washington during the middle of the war just to acknowledge and thank the Russian Navy for the protection of uh, the United States. She came to New York. She came to New York, yes, yes. Uh, we have uh, Lincoln and Alexander, though they came uh, from very different origins, uh, they both ended similarly. Both of them were assassinated uh, by those who opposed uh, their policies. Uh, of course, Lincoln was assassinated for uh, opposing the uh, secession of the South and also for freeing the slaves. Uh, but one of the reasons for Alexander being assassinated uh, was also because uh, it was a kind of early communist uh, group that assassinated him. And they felt, and this is something which is also borne out by history, that Alexander was such an effective reformer that if he continued reforming Russia, there would be no hope for communism taking over Russia, which was their hope. So they wanted to destroy somebody who was helping Russia so that they could come in on the ruins of Russia and control Russia, which they did for many years. Well, it's almost never taught in American schools, but I think... Uh, that's largely the result of the Cold War and anti-communist feelings which have been uh, extended to become anti-Russian feelings. That's why today uh, we also have constant uh, you know, attacks on Russia as the worst enemy of the United States. Russia is uh, you know, 
uh, spying on, uh, on the democratic process, trying to ruin the democratic process. Russia is committing atrocities. It is a kind of an anti-Russian hysteria, which is partly the result of lack of knowledge of the fact that Russia was the greatest friend America had for many years and helped to save America. Until communism came, uh, the United States and Russia were the closest of friends for about a hundred years. And in fact, Russia was the first country which, to which the United States gave the most favored nation treatment, a treaty agreeing to treat Russia better than any other country for foreign trade. So Russia and the United States were extremely close uh, for much of American history, but it was communism that twisted it into becoming hatred. And today there are many people, I would say many people in American leadership positions, who just can't get over the fact of communism and that communism is dead in Russia. It's not there anymore. And they still view Russia with the same uh, glasses, the same prism as they did communism when it's really a very different society now, which is actually becoming closer to Tsarist society in many ways uh, than uh, communist society ever was. And so personally, you know, I would say, uh, you know, we have to know the history of the past uh, and to try to uh, make uh, a better understanding of uh, relationship with Russia than we have right now. If uh, we uh, learn about the friendship of the United States and Russia, uh, we will want to uh, try to repeat that friendship, develop it again, which would be the best thing for the world as a whole, uh, to develop a good relationship of friendship with Russians.